Hey everyone, it's me, Alexandra. It has been a while since I have uploaded any content to my YouTube channel. It's Monday, March 23rd, and um, I do have some more like formal style videos where I like sit down with prepared content, but today I wanted to try a different style of video. Since everybody in my office is working remote, as is, as are I think most people, who have regular office jobs, I have a bit more bandwidth to create content. I wanted to try to be realistic about what I can commit to. Obviously, the irony is not lost on me that the last video I posted was my 2020 goals video and then promptly failed to fulfill my 2020 goals. So I think it's more about being realistic about what I can produce and what I can do. And part of the reason why I haven't posted videos is actually I've been going through a pretty heavy time in my personal life, which is probably not appropriate for me to share on here, but it's just meant that I had to deprioritize my YouTube channel, unfortunately, and kind of a lovely jot in general to some of the other things that were going on. And I'm okay with that. I know that I made the right choice and that's okay. I love a lovely John. It doesn't mean that I don't want to do what I'm doing, but life life happens, and um, and that's okay. So, for today, I wanted to check in with you with what I'm reading. So, my project during the um, coronavirus situation has been to find all of the books that I've abandoned, all of the books that I've started to read but never finished reading. They weren't like purposeful DNFs where they were like books that I knew that I didn't want to finish. Like DNFs are very clear in my mind of like, oh, this was not the right book for me. I'm not the right reader for this book. Whereas these are just books where it's like I got distracted by other things. I probably got a new book. They sat on my shelves with a bookmark in the middle of them or a post-it note in the middle of them just waiting for me to come back and finish them. And so I'm taking advantage of this time now well, I'm stuck at home to do so. So one of the books, the book that I'm currently in the middle of, is Chrétien de Troy of Arthurian Romances. Um, so Chrétien de Troy is a, was a French poet of the like 1100s, late 1100s, early 1200s maybe, who wrote courtly French poetry, romances, you know, having to do with King Arthur and Lancelot and all of that. And so I have always really enjoyed medieval literature. I took a medieval literature course in college and um, we didn't read a ton of the Arthurian cycle, but we did read like Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, for example, which they're apparently making a movie of in it. If you haven't seen the trailer, it looks really cool actually. I'm very excited about it. But for this, like my interest in the Arthurian romances was rekindled because there was like a really good Amazon Kindle deal on a book by C.S. Lewis called, it's like his analysis, cause you know, he was like, he's specialized in medieval literature. Uh, it's his analysis of the development of the romance genre in the middle ages. And so that was really interesting and frankly went above my head because I hadn't read a whole bunch of this source material. And then, like maybe a year later, I checked out from my library a collection of essays that was published sort of posthumously by, uh, what is his name? You know, Follow Your Bliss, Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell. And that was dealing with some of his analysis of the Arthurian romances. And his perspective was that they were sort of like trying to secularize the Christ narrative and give sort of purpose in the daily life of the hero. So anyway, so all of that to say, I've been very interested in this. Chrétien de Troyes is one of the primary authors or writers during this time sort of working in this cycle that is the source material for both of those books, and I am really enjoying it. So some of the things that I've been noticing in this from like an analytical perspective is this relationship between uncles and nephews. It's a very tense relationship, but it appears like obviously in the Arthurian cycle as well, because he's like killed by his nephew, I believe. And it even carries through to like Hamlet. I think I've talked about that before. That's like, obviously Hamlet is having a big struggle with his uncle. So yeah, it's really interesting to see how pervasive this is in these stories. 
I vaguely remember talking about it in my medieval lit class, and I think it's because certain like Breton tribes were actually matrilineal in power, so it went from like the queen's side, and how does that work? Comment down below if you know what I'm talking about. I, see, you can see why I make notes. I'm not very articulate. But the other thing that's really interesting in here is this way in which there's like a t tension, it seems like, between Chrétien de Troyes and his patroness. So his patron was the Lord and Lady of Champagne, apparently. And so you can get this sense of tension between the Lady of Champagne wanting to write more like adulterous affair type stories, like very much the Lancelot and Guinevere or the Mark and Isolde type of framework. And you can see that Chrétien's like really pushing against that and wanting to have like a legitimate love between a married couple, if you will. Legitimate. Um, and so the first story that we have is Eric and Anid, and that's like a, a very much working in the thesis that Chrétien seems to be wanting to put forward is this like really deep love between these two people who got married to each other. And then I just finished Cliché, I think is how it's pronounced, and that was sort of like this longing love between two people who can't be together, again tension between a nephew and an uncle. And then now I'm starting with the story of Lancelot, which is obviously going to be Lancelot and Guinevere, I suppose. And so it'll be really interesting to see how this narrative plays out. So C.S. Lewis's thesis was that the reason why these types of adulterous affairs developed in the high form of poetry of courtly romance was because the idea is that the, the woman couldn't truly love unless she had the power to bestow her love. And that meant that she would always have to fall in love with someone who was sort of in a position beneath her in the court. And that's why a queen can fall in love with a knight, but she can't really fall in love with her husband, the king, because he has power over her and he can sort of demand the love from her and that automatically makes it not true love. So it's really interesting to see how that thesis is playing out in these books, so or in these stories. And to be honest, they're actually like really readable. I was afraid that they were going to be kind of hard to read and too old-fashioned, but this translation is really nice. I don't know if they made it readable on purpose or whatever, but it's a Penguin Classics edition. I got it at a second-hand bookstore, and it's, you just like fly through these stories. They're action-packed, and um, there's not a lot of dialogue. It's mostly just telling the events of the story in a really kind of fast-paced way. Anyway, that's probably enough of an update for today. I will see you guys tomorrow.